All right. Welcome back, Nightmare Success listeners. Before you come, what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? Well, I have really been excited about this interview because Walt Pablo is one of those guys that, for me personally, I just, I so much admire what he's done with his life because he went through his nightmare, but what he's done with his life after he went through his nightmare. I was going to read you some, his description of his book, and his book is called Stolen Without a Gun. And uh, I'm just getting into that. I've just started reading it uh, last few days while I was riding my bike, riding my stationary bike. I can't really <laughs> write, do that by reading while I'm riding my bike outside. But anyway, I, I want to read this. This is just a piece of uh, the description of his book. Walt Pablo was a young MBA rising quickly through the finance ranks at the nation's second largest telecom company, as MCI, with a beautiful wife, two kids, and a promising career. He epitomized the American dream. Pablo's life took a dark turn when he became a willing participant in the company's efforts to hide from investors and potential acquirers a mountain of bad debt run up by mobsters and other unsavory customers. That, that drew me in. I'm I'm reading that one. <laughs> Even on the bike. Even on the bike, that <laughs> was sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Walt made uh, appearances on the Today Show, ABC Nightline, a contributor to Forbes Magazine, CNBC, and Fox Business. Uh, Walt's an incredible speaker. He's a nationally recognized keynote speaker who's spoken at uh, top-ranked MBA schools, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, the big four accounting firms, law schools, and other major corporations across the United States. Like I said, he's got the book, Stolen Without a Gun. He's the president and co-founder of Prisonology. I can't wait to unpack all this with Walt, but I first want to recognize our show sponsor, Auto Plaza Direct. You know who likes spending a couple of weekends walking the car lots looking for a car? Then you spend four or five hours in the dealership to buy a car kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way to take away all that pain and hassle of getting a car. It's got Auto Auto Plaza Direct. They're your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want, what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price. They also offer you warranties and financing. Full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Welcome in, Walt Pablo. Thank you. How Thank are you? you. It's a good. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, Nightmare Success. I love the name. You know, because it's really very, it's very true. It's well, I mean, very it, true. It, and it's it 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 explains your life. You know, in your life yeah. story of what it, you you lived. And the other thing I think about Nightmare Success is that. You went through your nightmare and you had to step into your fears and all the other stuff of the unknowns of getting out of prison and dealing with being an ex-felon. How in the world do you get started again? And and I think that's the encouraging thing about your story, Walt, is, and I think that's why people listen to this show, is it's not a prison show. It's a show about hope. Um, how do you get unstuck? How do you get to the next step? And I I think one of the interesting things about your story, Walt, is, you know, you talk about growing up as a, you know, a Catholic kid that had a good family growing up. Tell us a little bit about your life as a kid growing up and where you were and what you were doing and mom and dad and all that. Yeah, you know, we're middle class family and, um, you know, and and everything went well. I, I have two, two brothers that are, you know, one's a couple of years younger, one's 10 years younger. Um, all have been successful. All were, you know, we were all athletes and played, participated in sports and academics and, and, um, you know, really, you know, detention wasn't something that was <laughs> in our vocabulary. So, you know, it was, I was just lucky. I had two parents and you know, a lot of family around and, 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 you know, lived in great neighborhoods with good people and mentors around me, coaches, teachers, yeah. um, you know, m- members of the, the, you know, faith community that were, you know, it was just all positive. There was nothing negative that went on when I was, you know, when I was young, you know, and, and, you know, in, in some ways, Brent, those are the things that, that, that um, didn't prepare me in, in some ways for the, the way that I would see the world later um, is that um, I had already, had always sort of had success in my life, had good people, 
things, adversity that I went through, I could work my way through successfully. Yeah. And then going to the MCI was total, I was a loser. It was a total loser. You know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find, I couldn't find right. But let's talk about it. that though, Walt, because when you went into MCI, I think one of the things that you talk about that I think, uh, I think people would find somewhat fascinating is, is that you were in a very regulated world before you went to MCI. Sure. You were with Goodyear. Uh, you were with some other companies that big companies, people know, and you had at a very young age done well for yourself. And I think you'd moved down to Atlanta. You kind of had the things that people want in life. And then you welcomed yourself into the wild, wild west of telecommunications. And that wasn't regulated, which had to be kind of strange for you to go from a highly regulated world to everything's free game. No, it's, it, it definitely was. But that was the reason that we were recruited to come to MCI was that we came from different backgrounds. I mean, they they hired people from everything. I mean, people who'd work in funeral parlors to yeah. business to whatever. It's just entrepreneurs. Um, can you sell? You know, it was, yeah, can you sell? Can you, and do you believe in this, you know, in this model that we're creating that telecom is not just one company anymore, not just AT&T and um, bring whatever you've learned in structure from all these other companies and experience and help us over here because we're deregulated and we we don't want to be regulated. We want to be free, but we also realize we need some organization. We need to transition from this entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurial company to you know a publicly traded company. Well, so I think if, if I remember right, and I, I could be wrong a little bit on the years here, but it it struck me that I kind of think you were like 31, 32 years old handling over a billion dollars in receivables. Is that kind of the time period of, of your life in that world? With, with the yeah. Yeah. I mean, of first of all, the dollar amounts don't even, I, I, I think about them today and they seem, they seem large even for back then, but they were just yeah. ones and zeros, right? They were, you know, just, a, you know, I, I don't think that I thought about it that much about how much money it was. If I would have, I don't know. I probably couldn't have gone into work that day. You know, it was just after a while, you just look at it. It's a, you know, it's a customer name. It's a dollar amount. And, you know, and there's a job that's got to be done. One of the things that I, we were talking about this before you got on, well, before we hit the record button, I think what draws people into your story. And I think the reason why you've been so successful telling your story is it kind of feels like it could be me. It kind of feels like when you listen to it, the guy next door was in this situation and he could go left or he could go right. And can you explain a little bit about how that happened as far as the company's doing, there's all kinds of money coming in, but they also have bad debt. People aren't paying and everybody's looking for good news and good news has been spilling in all over the place. And, and Walt, you're part of the good news. You're, you're right. bringing in and, you know, all these, and the other pieces of it too, which I didn't really understand until I really kind of got into depth of, of reading and researching you. There was a lot of money in the small businesses, not necessarily the the gigantic businesses. You were actually going after and, and basically negotiating, recruiting these small businesses to take, you know, gigantic margins, but then they stopped paying. Yeah, and that was, you know, that was the exciting part about working for our company. We, you know, we sold telecom services to the large companies, AT&T, Sprint, WorldCom, and um, they were just buying tens of millions, hundreds of millions each month. But the real excitement in telecom was from additional content, just like, you know, it'd be the equivalent of like apps today, right, you know, the, on a platform. But people were creating different products and prepaid calling cards telling somebody's fortune, giving them gambling <laughs> advice, um, sex content, right, you know, one nine hundred numbers. Yeah. One nine hundred. Yeah. To, you know, get your fortune told. I mean, these were novel, but like to the consumer were amazing products that all of a sudden they could now they could purchase. And the people, you know, the, the organizations that got involved in these businesses were a little less than you know good business people they were hucksters 
Yeah. And um, so now they're able to make, you know, significant amounts of money um, off of telecom services. They can have somebody talk talking to them for, you know, just a few pennies per minute, but can charge five and six dollars per minute. Uh -huh. You know, and that that makes it really you can make a lot of money. And that's what they were doing. They were making a lot of money. But they, you know, but at the same time, they just said, you know, why should I be paying this big telecom company, you know, for, you know, it's, I got this unique product and they were growing like this and they, you know, you need money to grow. And so you take some of that money off the table and that's what they were doing. And they were reinvesting in their company or adding to marketing or giving themselves bonuses or buying cars and boats and all this other stuff. And that becomes our problem, you know, and that's, that's where I had to do, go out and collect that money um, to bring it into the telecom company. But it, it was much harder it was, you know, it was out of control, you know, and, and and it was just impossible for us to collect money from these guys. Well, that's what it sounded like. It just sounded like you were almost like uh, dropping a, you know, a penny into the ocean and, yeah. and trying to, to, to recover all that. But, right. And the, 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 and the dollars were just huge quick. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was just like, how much does this company owe you? 10 million. How much is this company? 3 million. I mean, we were throwing around numbers of like, well, we're never going to see this, you know, this again. And, you know, and Brent, that's where I, I you know, I, I have an engineering degree and, a, and an MBA in finance. So I'm not an accountant, but I knew how the numbers worked. And, sure. then, you know, eventually there had to be a day of reckoning when you just say, hey, all these companies aren't going to pay us. But there was also all these rules where you could, you know, kind of massage and it. fix things, you know, for a period of time. And um, what you hope is that the day of reconciliation never comes. But, you know, it always it always does. I'll give the book away. <laughs> the day of reconciliation always comes. Well, and and I think there there's some things that were happening, Walt, that are just part of the business world. Like you had people that owed you three or four million dollars, and you did a promissory note with them and said you didn't have to pay for a while. Those were things that were just going on, and that was part of the deal. Whereas, I, I mean, I can see also, and as you tell your story in other venues that your feeling is that, gosh, we've got so much money coming in, you know, making, and like you said, it's not really cooking the books, it's helping them. Right. And helping them was also helping the company. And then, you know, the company does better, the shareholders do better, everybody does better. I can see how somebody could get wrapped up in that whole mantra of it's a team sport, we're all winning here. Let's keep going. Every everybody wins, even the consumer wins. You know, yeah. I mean, very rarely, and you know, it's it's a unique industry in which that you know, somewhat telecom was somewhat regulated. Of, um, but the consumer's winning; they're getting better products. The prices are going down. There's much more competition. The the technology itself is improving, right? I mean, so you know, all these different things. I mean, we come from a generation where you couldn't call relatives in another state until it's not eight o'clock yet you know you had to wait <laughs> until you know you unless you were rich you could just call anybody any time of the day that you wanted so to if true. You i forgot but, about that <laughs> but you know the tech the technology was changing at the time and you know sprint yeah. came on and said hey now we're gonna you can start making your evening calls at seven you know and everybody's like wow how that's revolutionary yeah <laughs> you know yeah. but um but that's what was happening prices are going down quality is going up different variety competition so in that environment, when you're when you're cheating, who's who's losing? I mean, right. the consumer's not. They're they're not complaining. They're not going to their congressman and saying, "Oh, I'm paying too much for." When you're winning, you get it's yeah, it's easy. Everybody and and that everybody was winning. The same thing can be said about Enron, sure. right? Everybody was winning. You know, price of energy is always a concern in our country. Now you got an innovative company that's taking making it cheaper. It, making it cheaper for everywhere. They're buying it in Alaska and reselling it in Florida. And there's this art that, that, that chemistry worked. They were doing things that made people like, wow, you know, this is, it doesn't have to be regulated. Prices can really be, you know, driven down. And that's what we were seeing in telecom. So can you share this story, Walt, of that? Because in your moth speech, you, you talk about this guy that you come across and he tells you, he gives you some sage advice about, you know, how you win and you're laying in bed one night and say, 
fuck it. I think I'm going to do it. What <laughs> can you lead us through that that sure. moment in time of how that all happened? Well, you know, the the moment of sort of crossing the line to benefit for myself came when you know this this guy um, you know sort of approaches me with a deal like we can make a lot of money, um, you know, and it it requires doing something illegal. We didn't say it like that, but it was like right. you know this is you know, but this is the way everything works. Everybody cheats. Everybody does something to get ahead. And and, and I, I looked at it at the moment and I said, you know, he's exactly right. I mean, you, you I don't want to admit it, but it seems to but me you were that seeing it. I was seeing it. All the cheaters were winning and I'm, I'm the loser. You know, I'm playing by the book and, uh, you know, I can't keep up with these people that owe all this money. And I see them <clears throat> out with executives in my company and they owe, you know, our company millions of dollars. So how can this yeah. It's a world upside down. And you're just like, it doesn't make any sense. So maybe I am the one that is seeing it wrong. Uh -huh. And, you know, there, there's a part of me that, you know, logic sort of goes out the door and you're just saying, you know, I'm pissed. I'm angry at the way the world is, the mm -hmm. way that I'm seeing the world right now. And I don't know how to fix it. But if I do know that if I, if I cheat, if I enter that world, I too will win. I could see it. I could see that I could do it. And then that was the, you know, that was a bit of my undo undoing was, you know, seeing that I could succeed. And, and number two, more importantly, succeeding in cheating. Okay. Yeah. I mean, right. It's, you know, it's one thing to, to think that you can cheat and win. It's another thing when you actually are cheating and winning. So well, and um, I, I, I think there's a, and I think there's a whole nother layer of a story there because you ended up getting money and being, even more successful, but you were incredibly stressed out, incredibly sure. um, uh, not happy. And, well, one of, one of the things I see found wealth in this right. newfound success. I think when you earn it, it it's it's uh, it's easier to enjoy, um, yeah. you know. And uh, and it, I I just wasn't there, and and it didn't provide the satisfaction that I thought it was going to. Um, there was a, way too much pressure involved in it. And, you know, just thinking about how does this end? You know, what's the end? What does the end look like? And look, I talk to a lot of guys that are involved in, in white collar crimes and stuff, and they they don't know how it ends either. You know, that's, you know, it's like, how do I jump off of this thing? Even if they feel like they're, they're you know, well, you know, look, I did some things wrong, but geez, you know, that this seems like a, an extreme penalty to go to prison. Um, but you try to figure out like how do you how do you end this mess and it usually ends it ends in a nightmare right it it you know it, and that's yeah. that's how it ends it has and it, you know to to the point of the this show it has to end it's it's maddening if it doesn't end even if you're innocent you have to think of oh, boy this has to come to an end i've got to move well, on with my life at some point well what was your well what was your thought because i think you had thought that you had everything kind of um deleted covered up wasn't going to be something that would be a paper trail. And then I think your boss calls you in and says, Hey, well, something looks a little weird here. Could you check it out? And then, you know, at that moment that, uh, there might be issues for you. What, what, what was going through your mind with, with that happening? Sure. You know, you know, you're, you're right though. I mean, there, you know, you can go through, you know, I, I went through looking at like, all right, how can I cover up my trail? I don't want to get in trouble. I mean, you know, it, it, and, um, I think that I've covered everything, but in my mind, I know that I haven't. I mean, I know there's got to be something. And so when, when confronted with something, you know, that says, Hey, let me, you know, can you, I, I've got to ask you a question about such and such. That's just a fear. You know, it's just your, your nightmare come true. I've been caught. Right. I don't, I don't know how to answer for this. And I don't know that I want to, because I know what happens if I lie. It's just, I'm just living for another day to get caught. You know, it's only it's only temporary. So you're, you know, you're, you know, I was looking for a way that this just has to be over. You know, I just can't do this anymore. It's too much. It's too much work. You know, when you're, we, we, it's funny, Brent. I've talked to a lot of guys before. When you think that you're cheating to get ahead, it's yeah. supposed to be easier. <laughs> it's not supposed to be work, right? right? You're supposed to you're supposed to cheat, and it's like, okay, now you know I'm winning the race and everything's good. And but that's just not how it happens. I mean, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of hard work you know, being involved in these kinds of things. Walt, were you all by yourself on an island? Or are you sharing this with anybody like your wife or anyone that you were around? Or were you truly just living this double life on your own? 
Yeah, a little, you know, mostly limited on my own, but obviously things seep out. I mean, you know, you, you know, you can't be, you know, in your right mind faculties going through all this stuff. So it, you know, it bubbles over into, you know, your, your regular life, you know, the inability to engage in conversation with family or having a short temper or, you know, things that should be simple or more difficult because you're sort of in this other world, you know, of yeah. what's going to yeah, go no, wrong I, in my life. Absolutely. So really I mean, tough. I, it is, it's, it's, it's really tough. And most of the people that I talk to, they run into the same issue because they don't want their, their loved one to get in trouble. Right. right. You don't want to go, Oh, you know, I'm in the middle of a huge crime. You know, what position have you put them in? You know, now they, exactly. you know, is a burden you put on them. It's like, well, what do I do with this information? Do I tell on you or, you know, if I tell you to turn yourself in, are you going to listen to me or, you know, and, you know, the, it just, it gets much more complicated. You don't want to hear anybody else's advice by that. I'm the one that got myself into this mess. I'm going to have to get myself back out of it. Let's talk about the mess. How long did it take for you when you, you quit that job? Did you have someone visiting you and you realizing that this is going to be a big deal? Well, you know, for, first of all, quitting the job is a, is meant that my life is sort of over as far as like, you know, interacting with people and things like that. I mean, because now there's, you know, there's an investigation and there's people looking into me and now I can't talk to anybody. And so, you know, when I'm seeing people, they're asking, hey, how you doing? And all I can say is I'm doing OK. And then yeah. immediately get away, as far away as I can from them. So, I mean, now you're even further isolated, you know, and then there's you know, like with everybody else, there's a few co-defendants that you start with. And then all of a sudden those phone calls stop coming. And, yeah. um, you know, you realize that you're, you're even more isolated than you're, you're really on like, your well, own. Yeah. What did I tell those guys? And what are they telling on me about? It really and, paranoid. If, extremely. And, you know, I mean, half of what you're thinking in your mind is not true. Um, it's not nearly as bad as you think that it is. Um, but it doesn't matter in your head, you're playing through, uh, oh, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're going to come get me tomorrow. All my friends have left me. My family's going to leave me. So, you know, it becomes very real pretty quick. Yeah, no, it's dark. I, I, I think of it, I always thought of it like, you know, you, you feel like you're, you're fighting this battle, but they've turned off the lights and the, the floor is dropping and it's dark and you keep reaching for the edges and they just keep going further and further out. Right that that feeling of of no control when all you're doing is battling paranoid uh, and there's nothing like seeing your name in the united states of america versus your name yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything more intimidating in life that you can ever look no. at knowing no, no. That that's not yeah. good no We're that's not yeah there. that's not good that's not going to end well which is i think where you just start you know let's just let's get this over with you know, you, yeah. there comes a point where you just can't plead guilty fast enough. Just, mm -hmm. you're, you're not even thinking about whether you're guilty or innocent. It's like, just put it on a piece of paper. Let's I just end this over thing. With. Get started, yeah, let's get just, over. Right. This has to end at some point. And, and, um, you know, that's pretty much what happened with you Walt, wasn't it? You just said the hell with it. Let me call my attorney. I'm going down there. I'm, I'm going to turn myself in. And yeah, we got to, we got to find, you know, we, I know what the truth is. And I know that it's not good. And everybody else has a version of the truth that they're telling out there about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it, it that benefits them, right? I mean, that's what that's what people are doing when they're cooperating. You know, they're telling about other everybody else's sins but their mm -hmm. own. Um, so you know, there had to be a time when it just come it has to come to an end. You know, your financial resources are are you know, cooked. Why you're uh, you're you know, you you don't have any income coming in. And, um, you know, you got to figure out like, you know, how do we, how do we stop the bleeding here? Because this isn't going to, you know, this isn't going to end well. So those, those are really difficult conversations to have with your family and they're difficult decisions that, that you have to make on your own, you know, about, you know, how, to, how, how do I put this behind me? What's the best way to do this and limit the damage, you know, at the same time. You don't, you don't have any, you have no negotiation, right? You have no leverage. You know, it's, you're going no. for mercy. You know, that's what you're no. saying. Hey, I'm screwed up. I gotta, I, I gotta get myself out from under this. I don't know how to do it. So you finally, you, you, you do the plea. I think you were, were you sentenced to three years? 
41 months. Yeah. 41 little, months. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us about what your thoughts were when you were, when you entered that world, because it's, everybody's kind of got a different feeling because you're entering a primitive world where everybody, nobody that you're around knows anything about it. Right. I couldn't find anything. I was try I was just desperately trying to like to look to see what, what a federal bath prison bathrooms look like. Right. <laughs> where, where am I going to be taking a shower? You know, it was, I couldn't find, I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of state prison stuff, but I couldn't find the federal prisons. I was just trying to find something where, What's it look like on the inside there? And then how am I? Well, you're looking, you're, I'm going to date myself. I mean, look, I'm going back. I mean, you know, when I was looking at plea deals, I was, in, you know, 1999 and 2000. Yeah. I mean, there's no internet then. I mean, there's barely any internet. I mean, you know, no. the Bureau of Prisons doesn't even have a website. So, right. um, you know, you're sort of on your own asking around, you know, doing the old analog, you know, now you're, you know, and this is when you find out you know, some of your buddies, you know, you know, you kind of level with them. Hey, I'm going to prison. They go, oh, you know, I meant to tell you my, you know, my brother went to prison, you know, and I'm like, well, let's talk to him. You know, all the <laughs> secrets come phone. out, you know, in your, in your own, you know, network, you you know, people have stuff in their own families. And, you know, to me, yeah. it was welcome. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Your brother went to prison, you know, T can tell me about it. And, you know, and he was telling me about his experience and believe it or not, his experience was 15 years earlier. So it yeah. was, you know, it wasn't even relevant. But to... you're desperate. Like, I remember I was so thankful for this uh, friend of mine, Ed Levinson, who was a big time home builder uh, in the in this region. And he had gone to Leavenworth and he literally drew me the prison on the inside. Right. Before I, and I, that was like so like gold to me that he had right. done that because it just kind of gave me a, like an idea of where would I be? What, what would it be like? Well, it's, it's sort of, there's a, there's a control aspect of this that makes you feel better. I mean, even asking for a date that you're going to surrender on and that, and that being given to you is sort of like, okay, I'm driving this bus a little bit. Right. Yeah. And, and I know when I'm going to get out, you know, yeah. I'm, going, I'm going in and, and then when I get out and then other things are going to happen, you start to feel some sense of control. And I can appreciate that just somebody giving you a layout of, of something and just talking to it about it you're like okay i'm now i'm back in control again there's something that i can understand yeah but i'll tell you something that really i don't know if it was the right thing to do for me looking back on my my wife and i drove up the night before and we were watching and the sun was getting ready to go down it was kind of you know the you could see the guys walking the fence you could start seeing the the lights come on and the in the uh, different block cells. And and I didn't say anything to her, but I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I am going to be inside there tomorrow night. That's going to be me. And it's not going to be for like a, a week or a month. Right. I have a five-year sentence. I, I am going to, that is, that area right there <laughs> is going to be where I am for a while. And it was just such a, like, deep, dark feeling that I didn't share with anybody. I went to right. bed with it that night thinking, did, did you have anything, Walt, before you went in or the day you went in of how you there is no There is nothing more frightening than the prospect of prison. I mean, I am telling you, it. I deal with guys every day and I try to settle them down and they will be settled down, but only once they're in there because yeah. the, the, and I still can't figure it out it, it maybe it's because of our country, you know, how much we appreciate freedom and it's just a part of our lives. So having your freedom taken away is like the worst thing. Yeah. And it's, it, it, you know, in many cases, you know, you don't want to wish disease on somebody, but that's more understandable <laughs> than prison. Prison yeah. is just not understandable. It just is so foreign. And, you know, look, I, I'm with you, you know, you're looking at this fence and go, I'm going to be over there. I don't even know what's over there, you know, and, 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 you know, crossing over this, you know, to, to another world is just something that is just you know, frightening to, to people. I mean, people take their lives as a result yeah. of not being able to, you know, to go through yeah. with it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and I think you bring up a good point too, while it's on, on calming people down because nothing is as bad as your mind makes it out to be not Correct. in prison. Correct. You know, my biggest surprise in prison was the uh, 
you know, I, I always joked that I was standing at the gate there and I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I guess I get raped and then right. <laughs> I get beat up and, and maybe stabbed. Right. Was, I don't know. I guess it was just all those things that I had seen and the sure. My, and within, you know, once I got to where I was supposed to be, I could not believe how many people were wanting to help me get set right. up. That's that was one of my biggest surprises in prison was is that there were really decent people in there that had made, you know, some mistakes that put them in that position, but I had a but lot of helpful people get me. Federal from one is different. Step to the next. No, you're right though, but federal is different, right? I mean, when there's guys in there that have previous records, but a lot of the stuff that people that are in there, it's conspiracy related or yeah. you know, these gray areas in business and some of them not so gray, but you know, but these aren't typically people that have have long rap sheets and stuff like that. I mean, they may have had a few little run-ins with the law, but the feds whack them. And, yeah. um, you know, there, there are guys in there that have done drugs that would have landed them a weekend in, in jail with a suspended sentence and have six, seven years in the feds. So, you know, it's really, yeah. you know, it's really different. It's a different, different population than you see in the state. Well, speaking of being inside prison, did you do? Did you have like walls? Any particular things, strategies that you used to eat up your time or to deal with your time while you were in there? Well, I think you know it's the same thing that happens with everybody, Brent. You know, it, it, I always tell everybody you'll develop a routine, and you have to develop a routine because it, you know it's such a small space. But it, what I, I think what I, I think was most amazing about that that time is that even though I, I can't look back on in fondness, you know, of, yeah. but I can look back and say that I was productive. You know, I read a lot of books. I helped a lot mm -hmm. of people. I, I thought about my my health and my, you know, how do I, you know, go on with the second part of my life, which is easier to do when you're there because it, it's so much more difficult once you get out. I mean, when you're when you're in there, there's no pressure. Right. There's, you know, you're sort of away from everybody. You don't, you're not, you know, you're not going to the grocery store and people are saying, oh, there he is or something, you yeah. know, or even if they're everybody not, it doesn't, around he's in prison. it doesn't, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> We're not, we, there's no, we have no pride in here. Right. Right. So, but even if people aren't talking about you at home, you think that they are. So they might as well be right. Sure. You know, you, every day you know, I'm walking in here, I've got my sunglasses on and a ball cap. Does anybody recognize me? Yeah. You know, but when you're in there, you're allowed to sort of escape. And I think that, you know, in, in a good way, you're allowed to sort of reflect what, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? How, how is this going to work out for me? And it's a safe place to do that because it's not as safe a place when you're out. I mean, you got to, and now I got to move on with life. How, how do I interact with people? How well, do there's, I? There's, there's people that get very, very afraid of getting out. Yeah. You know, they, they sure. unplug themselves so much from society and get so used to the ugly prison routine that that becomes more familiar to them than being, than being out and, and yeah. having to deal with all those pressures that come with that. I know you shared a funny story about your, it might've been the first day you were there with your buck mate. And he, he was telling you about, um, I think he was dealing in drugs and he, he dropped out when he was in eighth grade. Right. <laughs> and then I, and then I tell him, you know, and then he, you know, he's telling me his story of woe, and, um, you know, and then I tell him, I was like, you know, I don't really have any excuses, right? You know, I, I was raised in a good family and I had a good education and then I went to work and I embezzled, you know, $6 million. And he was like, damn, I should have gone to college. I should have gone to college. <laughs> you know, and we think about that. It was the funniest thing because he that's was like, you know, I, I, yeah, you think about, you know, it was sort of telling and put, put me in my place a bit, right, too. It's like, you know, I shouldn't be here. You know, I really should not be here. I should have known better. But you know, to to, to be able to see some humor in that, there that, is uh, humor in prison, though. I mean, that's that you, there. There is. I think you know we we had a place called Crackers Corner that we all you know time to time there was laughing. You know, there was stuff. Right. But well, you kind of had an a. a I haven't talked to anybody. On, I've done over a hundred of these interviews. I haven't talked to anybody that had the FBI come into the prison and say, Hey, we want to work with you, Walt. Right. Can you, can you be somebody that we can teach, basically teach them? What, what was that like for you? Because here you are in prison. How does, how does, how does that even happen? How do they contact you? 
Well, you know, so there was, you know, there, there was an ongoing case, um, and uh, I was asked to testify, which is extremely difficult to do, you know, because you know the the families and the people that are sure. involved, and um, but it's my deal, you know. Everybody's on their own at that point, and um, you know, I was I was able to tell a story pretty well, and um, you know, and the and the FBI was looking for case studies. They were putting together this WorldCom Enron task force, and they were looking for somebody to tell a story. And they had had a good experience with this guy named Frank Abagnale from the movie Catch Me If oh, You Catch Can. Catch Me If You Can. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, they they felt that that was an was effective way to teach. Was he one of the first teach. guys, Walt, to do that, to work with them that way? Was that like... Frank, Frank I believe, was to, you know, yeah. to an extent. I mean, I think that they've, they've had success working with people before. Um, but, you know, here you have, it's a unique situation. I mean, you know, other white collar criminals aren't going to put a hit out on me. Right. You know, I'm not telling on a drug cartel or something. So it yeah. makes it unique to, to like embrace helping authorities to deter for, crime. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is how it happens in large corporations. And, you know, look, Brent, in life, you work hard and you get lucky. And I worked hard and I got lucky and, and they were looking for somebody to, you know, to, to talk about accounting fraud. And I happened to be that person at that time who could tell a story. And, um, you know, the rest is in, in, in many ways, history is still, you know, it was a lot of hard work, but the FBI introduced me to, you know, IRS postal inspectors. Um, and, you know, that became the ability to be a living and breathing case study of this is how you do it. You don't have to apologize for it. You can be sorry for your actions, but it's like, I got a job to do. I got to tell you guys how I did it and the way that I was thinking. And, you know, so that you can, you can stop this. I mean, really, if anything else, scare kids enough, <laughs> they're going out in business. Yeah. Like you're going to see this stuff. Do, do not, do not get involved in this stuff. Well, and the other thing too, I wondered, Walt, is like, you know, being in the, entering that world, like the Quantico and, uh, the FBI world and then the, you know, U.S. Attorney, how, how were you treated? Or did you feel like you were treated as a, I don't even know if you'd use the word colleague, but there's a difference between being treated sure. as a guy that's here as an expert, as opposed to a guy that's here as an ex inmate. You know, I can tell you that um, my experience was a very positive one throughout. I mean, you know, one of the things that I like about our justice system is one that I also don't like. There's a lot of collegiality. With it. There's a lot of people that know one another. You know, yeah. the judges know the probation people. Yeah. The probation people know the prosecutors and the defense attorneys knows all of them. And they go to yeah, the same parties. To Christmas parties together. Right. So, you know, you're trying to figure out when you're in there, like, well, who's on my team? Right. And, um, you know, that's that's hard. And then once you've I've sort of busted through that and was on the other side of law enforcement and looking at it, you know, I could see that these these are hard jobs, um, you know, and, um, you know, I don't agree with the way that they prosecute some of these cases sometimes, but it is really a difficult job to put all the evidence together and, you know, present the right. case and stuff. You know, those are those are, you know, a lot of pressure. And in the end, they're just people, too, you know, may not agree with everything that well, they yeah. do. But they're, they're on the other side and they're, they're on the they're other trying, side and they, yeah. they, they they've got the pressures. I got to nail this guy. You know, I got to stop this. I got to do, you know, whatever it is that they do. It is a high pressure on both sides, you know, of, of the equation. Oh, gosh. So, well, if we if we go back a little bit when you were getting ready to get out. And you kind of knew that this could be I mean, or were you thinking were you thinking this could be a possible path for you? on your second chance of working in that arena? No, I did not. No. I nope, I didn't I I, I didn't think that what, that was what like, were you thinking, Walt? Like because everybody's got those moments when they're getting close to the sure. door. What, what what was your thoughts? Again, you're you're in this vacuum of prison. So you know when I'm practicing walking around the track is like hey, all right, what's my what's my elevator pitch? Yeah. You know, I'm a good guy. I screwed up. I learned my lesson and I'm back here to be an honest person, yep. contribute to society. Well, that last one is a little more hard than you think that it was going to be because, you know, it's hard one thing to practice it by yourself, but when you're really in front of someone and you go like, Hey, you know, Hey, I, you know, I went to prison. I mean, the first thing you can see it in their eyes, like oh, yeah, it takes your breath away. Are they, are you, am I safe? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, right. there's, 
they're 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 wondering like all right well what did you do and you have to yeah, you know you have to be in a hurry party. right you, yeah that's right you gotta you gotta hurry up but that next thing is like okay it didn't involve children i didn't murder <laughs> anybody up, right. <laughs> right you gotta you gotta hurry up and you gotta and you gotta get to the point quick and you know i i, I think that i i found that difficult like anybody would all right you know you where do I go to work? And and I've been out of communication now. You know, I've been away for a year and a half, or two, you know, a couple of years. And um, and before that, I was away. You know, avoiding everybody. Don't want to talk yeah. to anyone. And so now I'm coming back and saying, hey, you know, I need some favors. Okay. Well, my network is much smaller than it was. Yeah. Um, so that's it. It's difficult. You know, it's difficult. How how am I going to manage life? You know, on the other side, what do I tell people? Do I have to tell people? Mm -hmm. When do I tell people? Mm -hmm. right i mean you know you, you you don't um go out with you know a group of guys and tell them the worst thing you've done within the first five minutes of them knowing you <laughs> it's like, right you know Freaking you don't tell them, them about your failures you're telling them about right. your successes yeah so you have to sort of figure out okay at what point do i tell them that i've made this terrible mistake and how will they accept me and does that you know do they think that i've lied to them because i didn't tell them sooner so you know it becomes a really really difficult and it and so, you know, back to your original point, though, Brent, I mean, after, after a while, when I, it wasn't working out, I did feel a sense of comfort of, of telling my story and being who I was and being original and being able to make a living of doing yeah. that. And owning it. Owning and it. owning it. Right. Yeah. I think that's that's what I like about your story so much, Walt, is that you you were having trouble getting out. Um, then you had, you know, your personal stuff that came and I mean, you, you lost that. Right. And and so you you were really starting over from scratch. And so what you did is you owned who you were. And that was the thing that actually got you to the next steps in your life. You 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 didn't let somebody use it against you. Wait a minute, I heard you were no, I am that guy. And I'm gonna right. tell you about why I'm that guy and what I've learned and how I can help you. That to me is inspiring because there's only one or two ways to go with that hopefully that nobody ever knows anything about you, which, you know, between you and I, we got enough pages to fill up Google for a while. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah. when we know that if somebody wants to find out though, they can't. So how do you do that? You own it like you've done well. And then you stand, and then you're really good at telling your story and people want to hear it. But when you found that no one wanted to take the chance with you, you took the chance on yourself and said, I'm going to do this. And that's what I think is such an encouraging part of your story is sometimes when it gets to the point, you are the, you are your commodity. You are the guy. Can you make right. it happen? And, and that's, you had nothing at that time. No. And in fact, not only did I not have anything going on in my life, the only thing that I knew how to do was to work for corporations. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I didn't know how to be an entrepreneur. I mean, it, you know, everybody thinks that they know how to be an entrepreneur. You're like, sure. oh, if I had everybody a limited, wants to be an entrepreneur, right? everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> it, it, and it, believe me, it is, there's a, there's a lot of positives, but there's a lot of negatives. I mean, there's something to be said about walking in and having your insurance covered for you and your family <laughs> and right. getting a paycheck you know, every Friday automatically yeah. deposited. <laughs> I mean, even if you have a bad week, you're going to, you know, you're going to get right. a check. Um, so it, you know, that was the, probably the most you know, the most frightening part was like, I'm not going to be able to go back to the world that I knew, which was corporate yeah. America, you know, that that's just not going to happen. That yeah. one's shut And some small businesses, you know, maybe, or I'm just going to have to do it myself. And so I look for a combination of the two, you know, small business, you know, is there something I can work with another entrepreneur who's a little further down the line, or can I just do it myself? And then I messed around with a little bit and then in the end to figure it out, I, got, I had to do it myself. And you made some great connections too. I mean, one of them that you, you hooked me up with Tim, uh, Tim Headley from Fordham university. Some of these guys, uh, they became such supporters of you and connecting you to the next dot, to the next dot. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's another thing. I think that for people who are listening to this, looking at strategies, if you're stuck, and you, you're looking for that next step, look for someone who can help you get to the next step so that they can believe in you and, and, you know, get you. Yeah. It's to tough. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely tough, you know, and, and asking for help is difficult when you don't think you deserve it. Tumbling. Right? 
it's you know and that's where you you know where people are you know that come out of prison you know they they want a second chance they want to do it but it's hard to ask i mean it's just humiliating to ask because yeah. everybody knows hey you know you shot yourself in the foot and here you're asking me for help i right. mean that's what why you feel I like in your chance. why should i take a chance on you and you know what i found bren is that you need time um you know it takes time to heal these wounds as self-inflicted as they may be it just takes time for people to trust you for you to feel comfortable with yourself um it just it just takes time and and a lot of the times when i talk to people you know i'll look back at my own story and i remember that i had accomplished a lot a year after being out and then you know so much more after two years but the thing is i wasn't nearly where i thought that i should be um but you know when you look back it was like oh you look i was I, I was that guy on the inside of the fence. Now I'm on the outside of the fence. That's a huge yeah. accomplishment, you know, Absolutely. just, and now I'm, you know, I'm walking around. I've got to, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm making money again. I, you know, I'm interacting with my kids or my family. I mean, these are yeah. huge, tremendous steps, but you just don't realize them. You're like, you know, where's my normal, where's my life that I, that I used How to have. How old were your kids when you got out, Walt? They were, let's see, in two, oh, they'd have been like uh, 11 nine and 11 so younger yeah so younger so they were young when i went in which you know that was just you know something that yeah. they are difficult to understand and you know my kids today are in their 30s yeah so yeah. you know you know and, and so those questions still come up today you know like they're the same age that i was committing this now crime. that was going on exactly right right so they're you know they have different questions about life and and we know that it's in there you know that it's something that they can you know that that happened to me what, how long was it? Because I, I, I so much agree with you about, get, I've been out seven years and, and I feel so much different now than I did in I, that first year I was out. And I, I think one of the things was, it's just the pressures of, because I did come out to a family and support and all those right. things, but I felt like I needed to be happy Brent, all enthused Brent, you know, everything's good Brent, but inside my head was spinning. like how is all this going to work? How do I fit back in? How do I, you know, how do I get this job? How do I do how, all these things? Right. And it takes a, a while to, I had one of my guests that said, and I thought it was such a good example. He said, when you're in prison, it's black and white. And when you return to society, it turns back into color and you have to fit back in like jumping into a moving car. And for a while, I think you have that sensory overload. Am I making it work? Do I bl almost getting your confidence back? And everybody around you saying, hey, isn't it so great? Yes, it's great. It's the most wonderful thing to get your freedom back. But the, the steps you have to take to feel like yourself is, is uh, it, there's, there's, a, there's some work there. No, I mean, you, know, you look, you say that, you know, you look back after being out seven years and think about, you know, how far you've come and what you've done and how much better you feel. I do the same inventory today and I've been out over 20. So yep. it's not going to go away, Brett. You're always going to be no. thinking about this, you know, and, and how it, you know, how it could have gone differently or, you know, am I making the most of the second chance and um, yeah. things I like that. A lot of that, Walt, I think there's yeah. a lot of that because you, you have a moment in time where your time stops. Right. So when you get out, you want to make as much of it as you right. can, as as well as you can. You don't want to waste time on doing things that you don't like doing. Um, you want to do the things that that make or fill you up. Uh, but then you've got to you've got to walk through a lot of the shit too. And no, it's really diff it's it's difficult, you know. And where you know where do you go from here? And look, at it, I I was on the speaking tour. You and I talked about doing you know different talks and stuff. Yeah. You know, there was a time. Every year that I was on the speaking tour, I always worried that like, okay, this isn't like a career. Okay. This is like, this is just what I'm doing in between. And then, you know, another year would happen Something and then I would be doing right? another speech. And I'm like, okay, this is like turning into a career, you know, yeah. but it, it was always frightening because I knew that it was going to end. You know, it, I can't be the 70 year old guy talking about what I did when I was really young, you know, like at this crime that I committed, I just said, it just can't go. And so, you know, it, it went, you know, I, I did it for, uh, you know, almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, and had a and very then, good career with that. Too. Great. I mean, 
great, so great career. Wants to check out. I mean, you can spend a day looking at Walt on YouTube and other things, and he's is um, and how he shares the story from so many different things on there. That the uh, I don't know how long ago it was it the ABC Nightline story was fantastic and yeah, uh, really. I think for people like myself that see those type of things, um, and that's a, that's the encouraging thing about this. The, the, this this goes into 275 prisons. So for those that are in there listening to this as you're walking the track, there there is life on the other side. It's it's not everybody goes there. There, there absolutely is, and you know what? It is going to be hard, but screw it. You know, I mean, really, it's sure. it's a chance, <laughs> and you know, really, particularly if you come out. You do have the ability to say, I served my debt. You know, yeah. I had a debt and, you know, that's, I, I'm, I feel good about it. And I'm, yeah. you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to take this chance and I don't, you know, I don't have to be proud of what I did, but I can say that I, you know, I, there was a law. It was, I, I said that that happened to me and I served my time and I got out and, you know, here I am, you know, Made the best I'm, of it. Make make yeah. the best of it. Yeah. I mean, you're not a bad person. I mean, and it takes me, look, my case manager, when I was incarcerated, did more to help me than any shrink could have. And God knows I probably needed one of those too. But she said, you know, you got to learn, you know, she told me, she said, you got to, you got to forgive yourself. You know, you, you're, you're wearing this on your shoulder. I can see it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and if I can see it, everybody else can see it. So you gotta, you gotta lose that. You have got to move on beyond this and that probably some of the best advice that I ever received you know how do you it's really difficult to forgive yourself really really yeah. difficult but you know you you realize that that's what you have to do so that you can help everybody around you and you I know? think that's something um and I'm just getting into it and you've been in it for 20 years I I the thing I like about speaking is is that uh it's almost like we, you know that that feeling you get before you enter on the basketball court or something that that adrenaline rush and then you get that feel of getting back and forth with the with the crowd and then that Q and A that comes after that that you feel like you've done something to further along to help through what your experience is and right. that's a good feeling and I I think that also helps Walt kind of knock that chip off you know giving back, doing things that, uh, you know, when, the, when these people are listening and, and, and you're going back and forth and, and you're feeling it, that you're making an impact, which, you know, that's one of the things I really love about your story. You, you didn't just kind of do it. You really did it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I jumped in with both feet and I, I always tell people that's a, you know, that's sort of what you have to do. If you want to be successful at it, you have to really own it. Um, you know, if you, if, you know, there, there's people that I've known that I, you know, that I believe them. They just said, you know, I went to prison and, and it was wrong. Prosecutors were wrong in doing it. And, you know, I, I'm going to go out and tell that story. And I go, well, I'm just going to let you know, nobody wants to hear that story. No. Okay. You know, it's just <laughs> a lot you, of pushback you, on that. There's a, you're going to get pushback. <laughs> I mean, because people want to believe that we have a system that's fair and, you know, that puts bad people away and, yeah. you know, the good people go on with their life. That's just not the case. But that does that story doesn't play well. No. So you have to, you know, you have to find, you know, the balance. Now you can, um, you know, not understand the totality of of a law or something like that. But um, you have to be willing to say, hey, I, you know, I paid the price. And and you know, you can have a book or something that doesn't do that. You're just not going to have a very big audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody can write a book. Um, your book on. Uh, stolen without again how long was that ball before you you i mean from the time you were out to the, you wrote the book mm -hmm. was it a long time or was it a short period of time? so I, when i when when i was in, inside uh, forbes uh, magazine reached out to me about you know they were looking at you know this whole world com was starting to sure. downfall Huge. and so yeah the biggest. so the biggest so um i gave an interview for them and they did a feature story on me and then the uh, the guy who worked on the story was a guy's named Neil Weinberg, who I'm still very good friends with today. Neil went on to work for Bloomberg mm -hmm. News, a great reporter. And um, he encouraged me to write down thoughts about the story. And, you know, maybe if there's a book involved, he would like to be involved in it one day. So I wrote it while I was incarcerated. I just wrote, you know, spent every day. I took 90 days, really, and wrote a book. And it was the quickest three months of my life. And um, right. Therapeutic just, too, I bet. 
there. Yep, it was. It was great. And then I got out and then I, uh, Neil and I shopped it around and and finally ended up self-publishing the book. And um, and it did really it did really well. We printed over 10,000 copies in 2007. So I'd been out of prison about seven years, about about the time that um, yeah. about how long you've been out yeah. and and, you know, put it out there. And it was, you know, it's been a successful book. And, you know, a lot of colleges use it. And and again, it's just, an, an, for lack of a better term, an unapologetic look at how I did what I did. You know, just yeah. like, just just tell me what happened, you know. Well, and, I can tell you, I love it. I, I was, uh, you you ran through my hour uh, yesterday and today. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a page turner um, book. And it's got a lot of life lessons in it too, which is what people, you know, hopefully want to walk away with. But Right, right. Speaking no, no. of life lessons, though, well, I always ask people this question, especially taking your whole life into this whole thing. What do you think is your biggest takeaway through all that you've been through to where you're at now? You know, I think that if that I, I feel better about handling, you know, uh, addressing the situations than than putting it, you know, putting it off. You know, the best way, I think, you know, to handle some of the most difficult stuff is to pick up the phone and rip the bandaid off and, and, and take care of it. And, um, you know, it, me sort of addressing it is, has, has really helped me. You know, I, I think of the, uh, the, the Victor Hugo's, um, you know, La Miserable, right. Just, to, you know, this guy sort of go, had gone through life being chased by his past, reinventing himself over and over again, only to have his past, continually chase him until one day he turns around and said, Hey, I'm not running from you anymore. And <laughs> his past sort of kills itself. You know, it can't handle that. The chase isn't going to go on anymore. And uh, Jean Valjean moves on with his life without having to be, you know, his past chasing him all the time. And I think that's a very valuable lesson. You know, you yeah. can't, can't let, you know, can't let that stuff just chase you. It'll wear, it'll wear you down. Great advice. Great advice. If anyone wants to get a hold of you, Walt, what's what's the best way to, in, to info in, info at Prisonology is probably the best way to to get in touch with me. We have a you know a consulting firm now where we you know use some of the Bureau of Prison strategies to help defendants yeah. as they go into prison. We I trained judges last week. I trained uh, U.S. probation. I you know train you know tra train a lot of different You're not people. Just a guy that works there. You're the president and co-founder. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I just work there too. And I just work. You know, I work with wardens. I work with case managers. I work with uh, associate wardens. I work with the former director of the BOP. Right. So I mean, a little bit of everything. I I so think that that is such a big deal to have people around the table having conversations with people, the wardens and judges and things of people have the experience to be able to sit at the table and say, here's, here's what happens. Here's how it really works. Right. Because so many of those are unfamiliar with that. Right. And if we, if we incarcerate so many people and have all this stuff, we need to understand what, what your, you know, what your taxpayers are paying for and yeah. what's going on in there and how you rehabilitate people and how you get them back on their feet. Cause there's a lot yeah. of sad stories in prison. There's no doubt about it. Terribly sad stories. Our days. Well, well, I sir, I, I mean, I, I really appreciate it. and 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 getting your book. I'm, and that's obviously go to Amazon. That's uh, stolen without a gun. If you want to check out my book, that's also on Amazon. Nightmare Success. Um, I love you guys. I've had a surge of uh, new reviews on Apple, which is awesome. That that just puts the show on steroids. Well, that's Brent, you're doing good. You're you're doing good work out there too. I mean, you know, look, you're you're you know, not only you're telling your story, but you're looking at you know your the you know reflections of your own story comes out in every interview, right? I mean, you're you're posing oh, questions that that you you've. You, you know, you pose to yourself, I'm sure, and you and you find a lot of commonality across all of our stories. You know, well, I, 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 and I love it, Walt, and, and I appreciate you saying that because I love doing it. I I feel lucky to be able to sit in this chair, and if I didn't have this program, we would have never been connected. We would have never been able to talk. So it's it's been a great situation to have a platform where people can share their stories and hopefully learn something from it because I always get something from it. So I, no, that's I great. It. You know, I, I, you were just telling, saying to your, your, your audience, I didn't realize that, you know, these go, these podcasts go into prison. So that's awesome. You know, that, that's a full cycle for me. I love that. Yep. Yep. No, that's great. 
If anybody wants to get in touch with me, BrentCassidy.com, that's with a T-Y, not a D-Y. I wish I was Sean and David, but uh, that's a T-Y. <laughs> no, that's great. As, as I used to say when uh, I was writing my emails back and forth from prison, stay strong, and I'll do the same. Walt Pablo, thank you so much for being here today. Great guest. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me on. Time for success in and out.